بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اياك نعبد واياك نستعين تو دي وي ورشيپ اند اونلي داي هيلپ وي سيك اي وود لايك تو فرست اند فورموست اكنالج the invitation by publicitas to be here respected uh, mr nisar memon other members on the podium distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you i would like to begin with at least two disclaimers before i set out to present to you my views on the subject the first one being as of today I am not a banker. <clears throat> I shall henceforth remain a tudian. Now I've put in the French word there to add some confusion to the proceedings. Essentially meaning a student. And I shall remain a student for the rest of the number of days that Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala has left for me. Learn The second disclaimer that I wish to make and a very appropriate one and it is not laced with any modesty I assure you on that count is that I am possibly the most incompetent person to be here to be addressing you on the subject that we have at hand I possess no special skills in this area I think it was only out of generosity and their modest acknowledgement of bank al fala being participative in this process of holding the summit that mr shaja salauddin has given me this space and time thank you very much for that i have a friend here in the audience who never misses an opportunity to mention to me that please remember that when you indulge in riba you are at war with allah subhanahu wa taala and his messenger and that friend of mine is a friend of long years mr shuja qidwai who's sitting right here i'm so glad that he uses the word riba and usury because at that point in time my soul mate i e the devil the satan comes to my rescue immediately and says you indulge in interest not in riba so it prevents me from jumping over the fence to where i should be so i remain on the conventional side of things but he up there knows the intent and the motive of every individual present here and i can tell you that i may not have the effort to back up what i'm saying but i can assure you that the intent to learn about islamic banking is not latent but it is alive inside me and i pray to god that he would give me the opportunity to understand his word better as i prolong in my life ladies and gentlemen from where we stand today in the context of islamic banking in pakistan i am reminded of the title of alvin tolfer's book the third wave we can say that we are at the trough of the second wave bracing ourselves up to the crest of the third the earliest book that i could look at in the context of south asia was written by dr anwar iqbal qureshi on the subject of islam and the theory of interest this he published out of lahore in 1946 now the essential theme of this book was that like public finance banking should be part of social service and i want you to please keep this at the back of your mind while i present the remaining thoughts of mine now after the hasty beginnings that we did in the early 80s of embarking on islamic banking program the real launch really took place in the year 2002 and now in less than a decade you've heard the numbers from the deputy governor and the acting governor of the state bank of pakistan we are a little beyond the 500 billion mark that's close to about 
2% of the total industry base of deposits. The asset base has grown up to about roughly about 400 billion rupees. We have five full-fledged Islamic banking institutions in the country and we have a large network of Islamic banking arms and windows. The annual growth rate, the guesstimates are that Islamic banking is growing at a rate of anywhere between 15 to 20 percent. There are 400 or 500 Islamic banking institutions globally in the West, much to the chagrin and I would say disappointment. The institutions that lead in Islamic banking are Siri, Dashe, HSBC, and UBS. And I don't think any of these organizations have to their preamble the Islamic word. Now, almost a decade later, with the basic founding blocks in place now, we can sense that, okay, are we prepared to the next stage of Islamic banking? Where we will have to envision new asset and liability products, the broadening of the Islamic capital markets, the widening of the investment opportunities, and the availability of attractive solutions for short-term liquidity management. Ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned about social service, therefore, Please be mindful that attention will also need to be given to the man on the street who possibly has got the greatest expectations out of his Islamic banking setup. In order to attract the common man's interest in Islamic banking and Islamic economic system, we would have to develop fund management capabilities that will have to be honed in to provide the opportunity to benefit from Sharia compliant investment opportunities. In all these endeavors, whether present or future, ensuring the sanctity of Islamic financial transactions must remain the Islamic industry's primal concern. Already we are hearing murmurings and a certain amount of discontent and dissatisfaction in certain regions and among the various ulama of different fiqhs. These will have to be removed. No less important is the caring approach. There is public expectation that Islamic banking will be sensitive to the welfare of the common man. Welfare, ladies and gentlemen, is such a broad-based mandate which has only been achieved in a handful of countries. It will therefore might possibly be very unreasonable to expect a clutch and a very small cluster of Islamic banking to be able to meet this challenge in the very short time. At this point in time, I would like to just mention in passing to you that I was in conversation with a banker from Sweden and in the process of that conversation, I mentioned to him that it is a very latent and an ardent desire on my part to visit Stockholm. So he became a little quizzical about my interest in Sweden and he said, and what would prompt you to do that? And I said, I want to study Islam. He was baffled. He looked at me and he said, there are hardly 40,000 Muslims living in the entire country of Sweden. What do you want to learn about Islam there? So I am retorted to him and I said that what has happened is that while you may not profess to be Islamic, but you have implemented our religion and given it a practical shape, you're possibly the best welfare state. That is where we need to learn how to convert the Islamic economic system which will enable us to make it part of a social service. I don't want to use this opportunity to do any marketing, but I can tell you that at Bank Al-Fala, we are making very small and modest efforts to see that we reach out to the consumer base of this country and offer them products and services at affordable prices and make them attractive for them to deal with us. Ensuring the sanctity of Sharia-based banking and taking into consideration the well-being of the common man are, ladies and gen gentlemen, just two elements of the many concerns which my opinion should appear high on the agenda of this particular conference. I emphasize this because these two elements are of core relevance to our religion. We are all aware of the emphasis laid down in the Holy Quran and on the life of the Prophet. 
about the subservience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to perform good deeds and urge others to do the same. In my personal opinion, and since we have a, a politician present here, a reluctant politician, if I may use the term, uh, Mr. Nisar Mehman here, sir, there is one verse of the Holy Quran which sends shudders in the minds of the people in the West, and it is this verse, which says, enjoin that is right and forbid that is wrong, because it is an all-encompassing act. It is an all-encompassing objective of life. The onus placed on us to block the path of wrongdoing and evil is something that is critical to our religion. Islam teaches us to treat fellow human beings fairly and with example and by urging and inducing others to follow the same noble conduct. In order to claim this high moral ground, Islamic banking will need to reflect upon transparent Sharia compliant operations with a very clear distinction that must be marked in the working mode towards excellent customer service. It might even need to consider squeezing its own net margins. The financial institution will have to do that in order to enhance sharing of the profitability that it has with its depositors. The last may be seen as a premium to wrench the customers away from the conventional banking mode of banking. As someone who daily oversees working and results of both conventional and Islamic banking segments, I have to admit, and very honestly, that Islamic banking labors under a raft of restrictions and constraints. Coming this from a man who would feel shy about making claims of being top of all the arcane aspects of Islamic banking, I have no hesitation in admitting it. In my modest opinion, therefore, Islamic banking both in financing and deposit side is vastly a complex phenomena. The intricacies of calculating a rate of return on deposit product in Islamic banking would likely challenge the intellect of many acclaimed mathematicians. No less head-swirling experiences received when one delves into the niceties required to ensure that a financing transaction meets all the demands of the Sharia. I'm sure many of you would have been watching the Grand Prix on various circuits globally. I am a fan of it. I watch it on the television. What I'm fascinated most is the lightning speed with which the lit spots are handled where the crew swarms the car and in an unimaginable speed are able to change four tires. Speed and precision is the key. In Islamic banking, if I were to draw a corollary to it, the inviolability of the process is crucial. One false step, one action out of line with the process flow approved by the Sharia advisor and the entire income on the transaction is condemned to unintended charity, the emphasis on the word unintended. Charity, if it is not given out of free will, ceases to possess the test and quality of it being an observance of the word of God, where I have to take away money that I earned because I erred and call it charity is, in my personal assessment, a misnomer. And if one thinks that there is any respite on the deposit side, one is sadly mistaken, ladies and gentlemen, an intricate web of mathematical process known by somewhat innocently titled profit distribution mechanism monitors the returns on deposits. Two critical elements, respective percentage shares of the bank or the mudarib and the customers are set in stone. Decided a month in advance. Since the ultimate income for the month is unknown and the chances of targeting a desired return on a product, let alone a specific deposit product, are as good as trying to catch a butterfly with eyes blinded and blindfolded. Unfortunately, it is the very complexity of these processes and concepts that have ironically become trappings of going on a 
formidable path in Islamic banking, at least in the context of our own country. It is also unfortunate psyche of many of us to pass judgment on a subject without proper and adequate knowledge. Because of the similarities in the rate of return in deposits and the financing charges, people are extremely quick to tar Islamic banking with a broad brush. Tragically, those who are willing to give Islamic banking a chance to explain itself are bewildered and mystified by the technical labyrinth they receive by way of explanation. To the delight of all of us, fortunately there is also a growing number of people who refuse to throw the baby out of the bathwater and arduously patronize Islamic banking. Notwithstanding, therefore, may I urge upon you as a delegate to this conference that there is a compelling need now to break down the weighty theories and principles into smaller digestible pellets that are understood by the common man, the real stakeholder and sponsor of Islamic society and Islamic banking in this country. If I were to take a very broad sweep of the history of Islamic banking in Pakistan, we find that the initial efforts in 1977 followed by the 1980 legal framework, corporate sector received for floating Mudaraba companies and Mudaraba certificates. Deposits started to be mobilized on profit and loss sharing basis to accommodate government's commodity operations on deferred payment basis. From July 1982 onwards, banks were given permission to provide financing for working capital needs of trade and industry under the Islamic mode. Initially, 12 modes of non-interest based financing were approved by the State Bank of Pakistan. The second time around, and the banks took a holistic stance now, following the judgment that came in July 1985, where the Federal Sharia Code declared the procedures adopted by banks as un-Islamic. A more circumspect and a planned initiative was taken in the ensuing year, so in 2001, September, it was decided to shift to interest-free economy in a very gradual and a phased manner. And we saw the first Islamic bank coming in, which was the Mizan Bank, following which many other banks have followed and many banks have set up the Islamic banking arm. It is therefore evident, after the inauspicious first attempt, Islamic banking today is on a more solid footing and making inroads into the market. There are nagging issues that take the gloss of the Islamic banking. To begin with, there is an inordinate reliance on a couple of products. Although there are a good number of half a dozen products, Islamic financing related, yet concentration is in Marabaha and diminishing Musharaka. Even within that, mainly there are Marabaha denominated transactions. Secondly, it is the non-availability of the law supporting Islamic banking structure. Now, you would be amazed to know that in the United Kingdom, the authorities have understood the peculiarities of Islamic banking and understanding the nature, they have restricted the charges on home finance to a one-time charge only and subsequent transfer of units and property are exempt from charges, not so in Pakistan rendering the transaction either too expensive for the borrower or we go on to the infringement of the Sharia principles. Islamic financial institutions are also sometimes blamed for the slow pace in the idealistic Musharaka mode. Again, local laws related to rights, recovery, constrain progress in this direction. It is quite clear that given the multiple specific and distinct Relationships visible in Islamic banking versus the conventional where there is a borrower-creator relationship or a depositor-creator relationship and the absence of legal safety net hinders the Islamic financial institutions from becoming more enterprising in their efforts. Arguably, one of the most sensitive issues connected with Islamic finance is the difference in the Sharia interpretations in the different school of thoughts. I am not, as I said at the very beginning, anybody, let alone calling oneself a religious scholar anywhere near to religion, perhaps the respectable ulama who are attending the summit will be able to position themselves and throw 
enough opportunity for you to understand what is the quantum and weight of these differences between different schools of thought. However, it is invigorating for the cause when a single-minded community with different choices, synthesis among the Sharia fraternity on its fatwas can in fact become a symbol of Muslim unity that is otherwise nowhere to be seen today globally. Having said that, very briefly I would like to dwell on potential available to Islamic banking, particularly in the context of our own country. We have an agrarian economy and by and large agriculture produces 22% of the GDP. Pakistan is the sixth most populous country of the world and the fourth most large agrarian economy. These statistics open up for considerable scope of Islamic banking. Equipped with the Salam product that can be used with considerable acceptability and facility in agricultural financing. In fact, only a few months back, I recall that the government of Punjab initiated dialogue with the financial institutions, i.e. Islamic financial institutions on exploiting the potential of Salam to proliferate Islamic financial institutions in the role of agri-finance. According to an estimate, 30% of our producers lost due to lack of storage facilities of modern silos. Financing of modern silos, whether in consortium with the government or select farm can play a critical role in winning the hearts and minds of the rural populace. Naturally, there will be some concerns in the backdrop of the devastating floods, particularly in this province of Sindh. However, as I understand, and I think US practitioners understand it better, that Islamic banking is all about risk assumption. In the global perspective, the canvas widens further. There are issues of various shades and hue. The growing population has resulted in shrinking number of acres for agriculture. In the 15s, for every human being on planet Earth, there was 12 acres of land available. The figure dropped to five acres in 2000, and it fell to a miserable three acres in 2011. Agriculture, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, could become the next gold mine for Islamic financiers. Alternative energy sources is another area where an Islamic initiative can be of great significance. Allow me to set the tone because I'm supposed to be delivering under that title of the keynote. I need to present before you, ladies and gentlemen, that this conference must focus on the fact that Islamic economy has to conform to the dictates of Islamic Sharia. Islamic economic system has to stay clear of interest. Speakers and participants should make use of this excellent opportunity and facility for discussing ways and means of remodeling the monetary and banking system of this inverted commas quoted under the constitution Islamic Republic. Social justice is the hallmark of Islamic economic system. Adil and Ihsan must permeate through all levels of society. We have to work towards our akira. Therefore, Muslims, individuals, and corporate must spend a good percentage of their income and wealth on improving the lot of the community. There are challenges for the central bank for creating a more conducive environment for Islamic banking. The Islamic economic system must raise issues and be able to answer questions relating to deficit financing, the heavy reliance on bank borrowing by the state, and above all the challenges for us to create an Islamic social order where goodness is a foregone conclusion. I believe that there are real challenges confronting Islamic banking, but none that can be overcome. Islamic banking will need to take the bolder and more enterprising path to give the world the real vision of participatory financial relationships and the benefits thereof. Sharia scholars will need to make many bridges for Islamic bank and equally watch it with the hawk's eye. Once these activities are optimally blended, I am confident that the world will witness a new paradigm shift in the banking world. I would like to conclude on two, three notes. The first and foremost, I would like to quote from chapter 29, The Spider, verse 69, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
but those who struggle in our cause surely we shall guide them in our ways and allah is with good doers ladies and gentlemen i live in a society that is abound not with goodness that we have been talking about not the goodness that is expected in an islamic society i have no hesitation in telling you that if you ask me today who do you trust i trust only myself and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i don't trust anybody else therefore how do i lend money i begin with the premise with a customer no matter how good or how bad he is will he return the money because it doesn't belong to me it belongs to the man on the street i.e. the depositor creating that islamic order that islamic society creating of a righteous society is a prerequisite for an islamic economic and financial system give me an islamic society and i will give you in 24 hours an islamic financial system you take that away it's extremely difficult to implement islamic financial system that is devoid and shunned of the islamic principles Finally, in the end, I would like to acknowledge that it has been a great honor for Bank Al-Fala to be lead sponsor of this event. Bank Al-Fala's Islamic banking arm is today, alhamdulillah, the second biggest operation of Islamic banking in the country. We are proud and submit ourselves in prostration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us that success and for giving us this benefit of sponsoring events like this, which will hopefully take us towards a meltdown of understanding the precepts of Islam as our religion that we follow, which is a codified way of living. The benefits that must arise out of it in terms of both the economic system and the financial system. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.